Uh, on the, um, the program that's on your sheet, if you turn it over, um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but if you turn it over, you will find what would have been on my PowerPoint, which is the structure of the talk, the headings there, and also the books and articles that I'm going to refer to in the talk. Um, they're all there. And uh, just to say also that I'm going to be... Um, I'm doing this in the style of an academic paper, so I'm largely reading the talk. If you'd like a copy of it, you, my email address is there. I'm very happy to send it to you. Um, I know sometimes it's very difficult to pick up and to retain what you hear, but I'm very happy to send that to you um, uh, subsequently. I always want to say thank you to Greenford Baptist Church, to Pastors Warren and Satajit for um, allowing us to come here today. One of the reasons we've been able to make this conference without any charge is that they have very kindly made all their facilities available to us today without charge. So very, very grateful for that. So, just wait for those people at the back to come and join us and then we'll get underway. Okay, all right, fair enough. Okay, we're getting away. All right, so um, from October 1987 through until January 2015, I was one of the pastors here at Greenford Baptist Church. So I'm um, sort of back on home territory today, which is a bit of a strange feeling. First time I've been in this building for um, uh, over three years. And during that period, uh, Greenford Baptist Church transitioned from what was a almost entirely white British congregation to one with people from approximately 45 nationalities regularly attending. So in, by 2015, during worship, different languages were used with songs, uh, dance, prayer in styles that were used, uh, all the songs and the styles that were used back home. Every aspect of congregational life reflected the cultures and the different ethnicities that made up the congregation here. Now, my doctoral research, which I finished just over a year ago, investigated how this transition occurred here within Greenford Baptist Church. And one of the components of that research um, was uh, focus groups and interviews with 47 people who either were still in the church here or had been a part of the church. And the overarching theme that emerged from that was that the lived experience of people who were a part of GBC was that they felt welcomed, safe, and fully accepted within the church here. And this was set in the context of the experience of individuals of not feeling welcome, safe, and accepted in wider society and not feeling welcome, safe, and accepted for some in other Christian contexts. Key components of GBC that the um, research participants identified as being significant for them was the way that their first language was welcome within congregational gatherings, the way they were encouraged to engage in congregational worship using their whole body, the way that um, the sharing of food, dress, art, and other aspects of their culture of origin. The third culture kids, so those are people who were born to parents who were born and grew up outside the UK, but who were themselves born and grew up in the UK. From their lived experience growing up within the church here, they believed, and they produced good evidence to support this, that they were better equipped to navigate both professional life and general life than their peers from their own ethnicity who'd not had the experience of growing up in a multi-ethnic context like the one here. When I was reflecting on the research findings, I realised that there were several interlocking components that seemed to have enabled that transition which took place here. And I've, I've grouped these under four headings, and you can see the headings on the back of the, on the programme. And that gives the structure for the talk. Uh, and I'm, 
going to give most time on the first and less time on each of them as we, as we go through. So the four headings you can see there, thinking that enable transition, and that really is about the tackling of racial prejudice, and in particular the role of the tapestry metaphor, which I'll explain in a moment. The second is attitudes that enable transition. So this surfaces the practices of hospitality and of vulnerability. The third is structures that enable transition, and the key components here are Sunday morning meetings, particularly something called connection time, and also social events, food, conversation, and finally leadership that encourage thinking, attitudes and structures that enabled transition. So that's where we're going in uh, this talk. So we're going to begin with thinking that enabled transition, decentering whiteness. Now, we all use pictures and metaphors to describe church. Very popular ones among Baptists are the body of Christ, every member ministry and all of that, or the bride of Christ. But here at GBC, for 25 years, the key metaphor that was used for the congregation was tapestry. It originates from Colossians 2.2, message version, I want you to be woven into a tapestry of love. Now, one of the most significant features of the tapestry metaphor is that in a tapestry, the picture is revealed only by the distinctiveness of the threads. And that distinctiveness arises in the way we use the image here from the different ethnicities and cultures represented within the congregation. From Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, Romans 1, 19 and 20, the phrase is masterpiece and everything God made, it's the same Greek noun, um, make it clear that it's the church that makes known to the world something of what God is like. John 13, 34, 35 makes it plain that it's through our relationships with one another that God is made known. So using the tapestry metaphor, we see that it's through the juxtaposition, the acceptance, and the development of difference that an image of God is revealed. Now in, the tap in a tapestry, the colour that is most significant is not the one that there's most of. The one that there's most of is the background. The colour that's most significant are the ones that there are least of that make out the detail. Which means that the cultures or ethnicities that there are least of within the congregation can be the most significant. An implication of this for the church here was that it tried to ensure that the ethnic and the cultural uniqueness of each ethnicity was expressed within the church so that all could be enriched. All of this, the background, the uh, passage from Revelation, which Usha talked about earlier on, that, that image of heaven in Revelation chapter 7 being our destiny. And it seems from that image that the distinctiveness, as Usha made this point well, the distinctiveness of ethnicity, both in physical appearance and language, is something that makes its way into heaven. We will be recognisable in our ethnicity that we had on earth when we're in heaven. And there is something about our joining together as one, but with our different ethnicities, that reflects the nature of God. And there's a real sense of living this out on earth is an anticipation of heaven. You can tell I'm a bit excited about that. In Willie Jennings' most recent book, After Whiteness, the details are on the back of the sheet, Jennings draws on the understanding he developed in the Christian imagination, which looks at the origin of the understanding of race, which, by the way, he roots back into Christian theology. He roots racism back into Christian theology in his origins. Fascinating book. 
He asserts that the goal of Western Christian, sorry, Western education and society is to promote white, self-sufficient masculinity. In contrast, Jenning claims that God's goal is the creation of, quote, the crowd, the gathering of hurting and hungry people who need God, people who would not, under normal circumstances, ever want to be near each other. This is God's heart, God's plan. Jennings wrote of a diseased centeredness, sickened by whiteness, that grew from that pedagogical imperialism of the Euro-colonialists that shaped education, language, ideas, and the rituals of evaluation. He describes, quote, the constant refusal to place oneself in the journey of others where I am willingly changed by non-white people, and thereby an unwillingness to release oneself to the crowd. One of the striking things in the research in the church here was that people here did allow themselves to be changed and enriched by their encounters with people from different ethnicities. Jennings comments that in his in the long history of Western colonial education, rarely, if ever, have people or peoples been allowed to name and voice disagreements separate from the refereeing positioning of whiteness. Everything is evaluated against the white norm. At GBC, a viable and stable, genuinely multi-ethnic church congregation seems to have been formed. Although there were practical and structural changes that were clearly important, and I'll talk about some of those in a few minutes, the prominent role of the tapestry metaphor in the life of the church seems to have been a crucial element in enabling this process. And it's significant that the tapestry metaphor envisages engagement that moves beyond black and white. So often we think about racism here in the UK as being a black-white issue, and it's far more complex than that. The ethnic landscape here in the church was and is far more complex than a binary construct of black and white. There are Asians, Chinese, Eastern Europeans, Latin Americans, Middle Easterners, all among the church members. And the tapestry metaphor, with its diverse range of colours, great visualisation of the inclusion of people from any ethnic group. What developed at GBC seems to be an embodiment of a theological conviction expressed so well by Usha earlier, that all human beings are of equal value. So what does it look like in practice? A couple of examples of that, of that effective decentering of whiteness as the norm was that at GBC you didn't need to use English in order to be accepted. That decentering was reflected in sung worship in many languages and in the styles used back home. So when the song was sung in Hindi, the singers, the congregation would sit on the floor, the accompaniment would be tabla drum and bells and Sometimes the drone sound um, from the tampura, but we didn't have one of those, so we used a mobile phone app. And the accompaniment of dance, dance hugely significant. The freedom to use their first language in prayer, sung worship, is a significant component in feeling welcomed and accepted. I have some quotes in this presentation. All of these are pseudonyms. Tambara commented, so to have a church where your language is being spoken in the songs and the prayers, you feel welcome. People feel like they are human beings and not just second-hand citizens or whatever. One of the most powerful comments made to me, I felt here, this particular person had been in many other contexts for the first time ever, I felt here treated as a human being, not a second-class citizen or whatever. 
Similar comments were made regarding the freedom to use bodily movement, dance within services. Decentering was also reflected in the clothes people wore. The art on display. This is uh, one piece here. Um, each of these panels was made by people for whom the language, the words here, are all the language is the word for God in different languages. And the panel was made by people for whom it was their first language in a workshop over a weekend. And uh, it's, um, you can see there, it's not every language that was spoken in the church, but quite a few represented in there. So this is there at the front. People come in and they see their own word for God on the wall at the front. Very powerful um, presentation of that. Also the flags. Uh, the flags around are the flags that represent the um, different nationalities in the congregation and each nationality, they pay for their own flag, so they actually, in a sense, they own. And it's a sign that the space actually here is owned um, by the different nationalities that are a part of the church. In the preaching, it was a move away from a Eurocentric, purely cerebral approach to one that drew on feelings and imagination and drew the whole congregation into participation in the hermeneutic process. In this way, whiteness was decentered in the way that the Bible, scripture, was handled. Tapestry as a metaphor for church became a significant feature of the shared identity. And that insight that this metaphor had seemingly overwritten what Jennings describes as a diseased social imagination is perhaps the most significant finding of the research. Decentering whiteness, attitudes that enable transition, hospitable and vulnerable. In Christine Pohl's uh, great book, Living into Community, she comments that, and as a quote, communities in which hospitality is a vibrant practice tap into deep human longings to belong, to find a place to share one's gifts and to be valued. The practice of hospitality reflects a willingness on the part of a community of people to be open to others and to share insights, needs and contributions. You all know this, from Genesis to Revelation, it's clear that prioritising giving and receiving both of those, hospitality and welcoming others and allowing yourself to be welcomed by others, especially strangers, is a Christian calling. Research participants reported that having their own food eaten and enjoyed by others and eating and enjoying even unfamiliar food prepared by others was a significant component in the building of relationships. Tabia commented, it makes you feel very proud. You feel appreciated. They don't just like me, they like what I eat and they're eating it too. They're connecting with me. They're connecting with me. They're acknowledging me. It's so very important. Research participants experienced GBC as a place where they were welcome, not just with that superficial initial greeting. Again, Usha illustrated that in her experience in the church in the States. But it was a space where they were treated as equals. It was a place where they flourished through being allowed to grow, to use their talents. A space where they received training and opportunities for ministry and leadership. Many of those who arrived at GBC were migrants who had recently arrived in the UK. They had no existing friends or relatives here. They arrived as strangers, but they found welcome, acceptance, friendship and support, which in turn they gave to others. Honoria expressed this very clearly. She came here, came from Heath, landed at Heathrow, went past here on the bus, saw the church building, came the next day. And she said this, to have this acceptance was something that captured me. I didn't need to be tense or pretending. I always be myself here. It was a place where I really felt at home. Everyone is really open to accept people. 
And Honoria's account's particularly significant because she came from a family that she herself described as racist. And she arrived in the UK expecting to be badly treated because of her own nationality. Her experience coming here was very different. Research participants reported feeling free to be themselves, having the national flags, having the artwork of people who were part of the congregation hanging on the walls. In the hall in which they met for worship was also mentioned as being significant, a sign that people other than white British were welcomed here. In my thesis, there's a description of a, the experience of a group of ne Nepalis who came to the church for the first time and they suddenly noticed the Nepali flag and uh, just their reaction to that. So within GBC, as it was experienced by the research participants, the biblical values of welcoming strangers and hospitality were embedded. Vulnerable, vulnerability. I've been asked several times, church leaders say to me, in the light of your research, David, how can British church leaders best learn from other ethnicities? I reflect that being vulnerable to the challenges and insights coming from people from other ethnicities is vital. The practice of not privileging British views, being open to the views of others has been a key component in the development of a genuinely multi-ethnic church here. The intentional setting aside of a Eurocentric approach to biblical interpretation was a key part of enabling the congregation to hear and engage positively with theological, ethical and cultural perspectives arising from outside of Europe and North America. Talking about the arrival within GBC of the first people who were not white British, Betsy commented, I think our ways were what we've been brought up with and what we were used to. We assumed that that was the norm and that people who came in from the outside were going to come round to our way of thinking, to be English and be the norm like we thought we were. Because we thought it really is our church. It's really our country. So they'd come in and they must adapt to what we are used to. I think that's how we thought in the very beginning. But then, of course, that changed. An attitude that recognises that one's own cultural values and understanding are not automatically superior to someone else's. And that consequently, each person potentially can be enriched by learning from someone who might be considered inferior by many in church and society, seems to have been an important factor at GBC in enabling that transition to become a genuinely multi-ethnic church. The practice of vulnerability, the willingness to sacrifice British ways of doing things, was an important aspect in GBC's development. Thirdly, a bit more briefly, structures that enable transition, Sundays and training are the two that I want to focus on. The most significant findings about structure relate to what took place when the congregation gathered on Sundays. However, there's also structure that created space for social interaction, structure that enabled the training and release into ministry of members of the congregation, and structure that enabled the voices of minorities to be heard in the church. The decision to change the structure of the Sunday morning meetings seems to have been a highly significant aspect of the transition at GBC. The previous structure had been unchanged since the 1960s. The meeting was extended to around two and a half hours. The first section of a bit over an hour was everyone together for worship, for prayer. 
Then there was a 25-minute connection time in the middle when refreshments were served and people were encouraged to talk to each other. And finally, there was 50 minutes of activities in age-specific groups, which for the Bible, sorry, for the adults, was interactive Bible teaching. There were some newly added weekly ingredients in that first section. Included time for testimonies every week, the celebration of birthdays and anniversaries, and a time for prayer ministry. There was increased time for singing, praying, creative activities such as dance, poetry, drama, and painting, as you can see over there. And there was more time for Bible teaching. Eating together after the service became a monthly event. That lengthening of the time the congregation was together, the extra activities and the creation of connection time as a central part of the time together, rather than an optional add-on at the end, seems to have made possible many of the features that research participants felt helpful and welcoming. Research participants reported the time spent within the congregational meeting for the celebration of birthdays, an open microphone opportunity for people to share anything about recently experiencing the activity of God was important to them. The opportunity to dance during sung worship, which enabled people to worship God with their whole body, was likewise seen as very significant. In the previous structure of Sunday gatherings, there was not adequate time for these ingredients to be regularly included. I mentioned connection time a number of times. It was seen as being the most significant addition to what happened on a Sunday. It was between the two other segments of church, lasted around 25 minutes. And research participants commented this created space for new people to be personally welcomed and introduced to others, for new friendships to begin, and to develop, and for the conducting of business. I don't mean church business, I mean other business. As, of course, is normal in many West African churches. People were doing it here. I wasn't aware of that until I got into the research and discovered some examples of business transactions that had been done during connection time that had changed people's work situations and context in very significant ways. The inclusion of numerous social events, frequent Sunday lunches, church weekends were commented on. Structuring these into the life of GBC in the view of the research participants created many opportunities for friendship to develop with people from outside of their own ethnic groups. Ensuring that the voices of ethnic minorities within GBC were heard was also partly about the use of enabling structures. One important element of this was the investment in training with something we called the leadership training group and also the use of external training courses. The leadership training group was a 16 month long program that I devised. It was a mixture of working on character and skills. The training enabled people from ethnic minorities within GBC to be equipped for leadership roles. The leadership team and staff team during the period researched had members who'd been born and grown up in Brazil, Grenada, Jamaica, Nigeria, Singapore, Trinidad, as well as UK-born black, mixed race and white. Others holding wider leadership roles have been born and grown up in Cameroon, India, Iraq, Malaysia, Sri Lanka and the United States. Such a diversity enabled the voices of those from ethnic minorities within GBC to be clearly heard. Most of those who were recognised as leaders within the church, either in the senior leadership team or in one of the many other leadership roles, were graduates of the Leadership Training Group programme. This intentional investment into people, many of whom had no previous experience of leadership, public speaking or Christian ministry, created a significant resource for the development of the church and had a profound effect on those who participated. Here's one comment. This is a lady, uh, pseudonyms Elvita. I left everything and came here. So to come somewhere, be a stranger in a place, and then to, in a sense, find myself fitting in, and then being given opportunities I never, ever would have thought about. It was shocking. 
At that point, her voice began to break in the recording, overcome with emotion. She had grown up in the Caribbean. This interview took place 12 years after she was a part of a leadership training group at the church here. It not only helped train her for leadership, but also had a significant impact on how she viewed herself being welcomed and accepted as a part of the church here. Finally, and briefly, leadership that enabled transition, learning and serving. As I reflect on my role in leading during the developments at GBC, in the light of the research and wider reading, there seems to be some significant factors that enabled that transition. The first has been a willingness to learn. In the chapter, Understanding Intercultural Congregations, the reference to where that appears is on the back of the, of the program. Drawing on my experience at GBC and elsewhere, I wrote about the importance for me as a church pastor of undertaking academic study, of deep listening to members of the congregation, of visiting overseas contexts, and of giving and receiving hospitality. Here today, I add the willingness to take risks alongside the recognition that sometimes relationships and projects will not have a happy conclusion. <coughs> GBC's leadership team for most of the years covered by the research included the statement, the aim of the leadership is to serve Greenford Baptist Church by seeing her disciple for the work of Christian service, to be built up until we all come together to unity in our faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, to become mature people reaching to the very heights of Christ's full statue. The vision is for servant leadership, leadership focused on building others up in unity. And it's important to note that leadership here was and is always by a team that brought together people with different perspectives and different gifts. So in conclusion, there's so much I could have talked about today. I've had to be really disciplined. I could talk all day about this stuff, as you probably gather. But we agreed that I'd present these four concepts, thinking that enable transition, decentering whiteness, attitudes that enable transition, hospitality, vulnerability, structures that enable transition, Sundays and training, leadership that enable transition, learning and serving, along with some illustrations of what it looked like in practice. If you like a copy of this talk or the full thesis, which I am told, you can ask Wale his comment, it's very readable as it is. It's not a heavy piece full of academic uh, jargon. My email address is there, send me an email. I'll happy to send you a copy. Thank you. Rosemary.